everyone, especially Ted Jordan's class. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It's a long meeting, so if it's okay with Mr. Jordan, I'm going to invite you to maybe not stay the whole, class, the whole uh, meeting. It's three and a half hours, three hours long, so um, please feel free to sleep. But thank you so much for being here and interested. Uh, I'm going to pass the meeting off to our finance chair, Elizabeth Seifries. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the first of five planned budget workshops. The budget review schedule is available here tonight in hard copy as well as on the school department website. All budget workshops are open to the public, recorded and posted online with public comment welcome. The school board will open and close each meeting with the opportunity for public comment. This is a little bit different from our regular business meeting, so I'm just going to say that again. We open and close, so you, we welcome public comment at the beginning, and then we welcome public comment at the end again. Um, questions and comments may also be sent to me. My name is Elizabeth Seifries. I'm not going to try to give you my email address because no one ever spells my name right anyway. Um, but you can go to the school department website and get, navigate to the school board section and then you will find my email address. So we're going to start off with the school board's goals for the 2020-2021 budget. Number one, maintain and improve the high quality of education for every student. Number two, careful examination of line items and consideration of the success and effectiveness of the expenditures in order to provide a fiscally responsible budget. Number three, support for the 2020 through 2025 strategic plan goals. And number four, clear and continual communication throughout the budget process. So a little more about those goals. With regard to goal one, the continued excellence of our schools is a great advantage to our community and a point of pride in King Elizabeth. This commitment to outstanding education is evident in our Blue Ribbon Awards and state and national rankings. Thus, the singular purpose of each item in our budget is the continued or improved quality of education for our students. Next, each line item must be scrutinized to understand how and why it is contributing to student success in concert with its impact to budget. <clears throat> budget goal three highlights our broad community and school department priorities for the next five years. Our current strategic plan goals were adopted in the fall of 2019 following a community forum of over 100 people. It was called the Future Search, which included community members, parents, faculty, staff, students, administrators, I'm missing labels, but Tons of people were there. And the thoughts, aspirations, and concerns from that large gathering were distilled into these strategic plan goals. So the first strategic plan goal is health and well-being. Our schools will provide a supportive learning environment in which physical, social, and emotional well-being are valued and promoted. Second goal is global competency. Our students will be personally responsible, aware, empathetic, and engaged local and global citizens. The next goal is multiple pathways and definitions of success. Our schools will value, promote, and celebrate multiple pathways and definitions of success. Safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. Our schools will be safe and effective facilities. They will be updated and maintained to meet the needs of students and staff in accordance with the long-term financial planning. And finally, environmental responsibility. The school department will prioritize environmental responsibility, including stewardship and sustainability. Finally, in order for all stakeholders to understand and be a part of this budget process, therefore giving it the robust review and input that it deserves. The superintendent and school board must communicate clearly and often throughout the process. We will hold these goals, and they're sort of goals inside of goals, as we examine each cost center, each department, each school, and each program. As we move through every step of this process, we must also keep in mind the ongoing building committee conversation about the necessary improvements to and possible replacement of our buildings. Tonight, we will hear from each of our administrators and directors with an overview of his or her department or school. This is a chance for all of us to get a big picture view of all the pieces of our school department 
and how those parts come together to provide an excellent educational experience for our students. In order that we might have time to hear from all departments and get a global view tonight, which is our goal, board members will make note of comments and questions and then email them to me. Can't stress that enough. I will consolidate and distribute the questions to the appropriate people and we have following meetings at our Q&A sessions. So at this time, the floor is open to any members of the public that wish to speak. I ask that you step up. Do we have a, an area for them tonight to step up to? Uh, no, they can just step up to the end of the table. <laughs> okay, and this, is there a sign-in sheet? Yeah, I've seen it going around. Yes. Okay, so people great. Can so please step up. We'll have you just sort of step up to the end of one of the tables and um, give us your name and address. There will be time at the end of the meeting as well. So I now turn this evening over to our highly esteemed administrators and department heads for their presentations. Again, please hold all questions and comments so that each person may complete his or her presentation. And Superintendent Donna Wolfram will make the introductions. So uh, before we start, I do have some news from Augusta. Um, I was at a superintendent's conference on Thursday and Friday, and um, they are planning on getting the ED 279s to us by February 1st. They're working really hard, so that will be the no notification of our state subsidy, how much money we're getting from the state. And also, um, in the uh, commissioner's um, budget that request that she's putting in, it shows a, um, a, a decline in the mill rate. The mill rate will be down to 8.18 from 8.28. So that impacts the amount of money um, the state gives us and the locals give us. So that's good news that it's down. So those two pieces of information. So we're starting tonight with Jason Mancharides, principal of our Uncombe Elementary School. So Jason. Okay. Thanks. Stay right here. Jack, can, can you pick us all up if we just Stay here. Sorry? Can, you, can hear, you can pick us up on the table. I can, yeah. Okay. All right, thank you, Donna. And um, I'd like to and thank you again, Donna, just for um, facilitating the beginning of another great uh, budget process this year. And I'd like to thank the board for the opportunity to um, present tonight. You, you all should have my packet. And I actually, um, if it's not too difficult, I had planned to kind of present in a slightly different order than the packet is in. And so. Um, I don't want to um, confuse anyone, but if you kind of look page through my packet, what I'd like to do is start with new program position evaluations. You can just take a minute. If you open it up, it may be easier to just take it apart. I'm not sure, but, but I, I believe they're last in the packet. So you, they look very much like the proposals, but you're just looking for it to say that. Yeah. So I'd like to start with those to kind of celebrate some of the things that have been happening and then move into kind of the, the whole uh, staffing of the school and, and highlight uh, a couple of proposals I have for some of Okay. So, um, so again, you know, I always like to start just thanking the board and the community for um, the support that we received. Um, uh, and so that's why I start with the evaluation piece, because these are positions that were um, approved and were new last year, and things are working out really well. So I'm going to start with the, the first one is the program position is 504 Support Ed Tech. Um, and so that is a position that um, was brought about because we had um, a student with some particular needs that required um, additional adult support. And so, obviously, I can't go into great, any great detail about that position. Um, it's been extremely beneficial and needed. Um, and I note at the end, at the end, um, so, actually, it's not on here, but it looks like it didn't all copy. But anyway, so this position is 
is determined, the need for the position is determined by a 504 team. So as of right now, we require the position, and I will be working with the team, um, which includes teachers and parents and administrators, uh, to determine if this position is needed going into next year. So in a way, it's to be determined. We're assuming we may need it, but we're being very thoughtful and critical and, and only um, asking for what we need. So I don't have a solid answer for you, but I still wanted to um, just tell you that it's it's been um, something that's very needed and beneficial and may be needed next year, if that makes sense. So the next piece the cafeteria and recess support aids. So just to go kind of back to this again, this is something that we are very grateful for and it's impacted our school greatly. Um, so there are actually four positions that are each, um, they're each 2.25 hours per day, about four positions in the budget. We have only this year been able to fill two of them. And so it has, um, increased uh, predictability and it's increased uh, planning time for teachers. It has, it's now that we're getting on a roll, we're beginning to create more consistency and expectations in the cafeteria. Um, you know, the, the more we hire great people to do this and retain them, the more consistency we'll have over time. Uh, so, although we filled only two, I'm highly recommending that we leave the four positions that are in there, in there again, and really try to get creative and improve and fill all four for next year. That would be my goal. Um, we have made it this year and been successful with two, but I think we would see great benefits from four if we could fill all four. So I'm recommending that those stay in the budget. And let's see. So finally, for the evaluations, um, Last year, we were able to, we were fortunate enough to increase a health and wellness position from 0.6 FTE to full time. And that enabled us to serve all students at Concord with health and wellness instruction. And so our K and 1 students have this year for the first time been in, um, able to access a mindful movement um, um, class in the Allied Arts rotation and it's been going very well. I've been in several times and observed and talked to kids and talked to teachers and things are going well. And um, so we're able to, um, from that, provide this benefit for our children and we've been able to create and maintain equity and planning time for teachers through that as well. That's another impact of it. So um, that's been wonderful. So what I'll do next is go to this a one page, this, or actually a two pager. And so I'm going to go through the staff I'm recommending, including current staff, and then I will, from this, I'll highlight a couple of new proposals I have. Okay? So let's work here. So you can see, just going through the um, projected enrollment, we are, um, you know, we never know for sure what kindergarten will bring. Uh, we're hearing people are already calling to register. We're hearing a lot. So we're going to um, project approximately what we usually have, around 100 students. So that would, um, and then grades 1 through 4 are a lot, of course, easier to project because many of the students are already present in the school. So that speaks for itself. So based on that enrollment, um, just going down, recommending, um, sticking with two administrators, um, sticking with having two secretaries in the office is current. So under counseling, we currently have one school counselor. One of my proposals is I'm proposing an additional counselor for Bond Code. Um, so um, in my packet, I've included some supporting documentation. I won't get into this, but it's there for you to look at. Um, it talks about um, American Counselor Association recommendations for ratios and it talks about what our ratios are, so you can look at, there's information there for you to look at. Um, so I, so the, the additional counselor is um, a new proposal. And what that would do is allow 
all students access to counseling services and more consistency in what we're providing. Our, our one counselor with 525 students is often pulled in many different directions, has to cancel classes, cancel small groups, cancel. So we're finding that uh, although she does an amazing job and works hard, lots of inconsistency there. And so and we also would like to have our counseling team be able to not only provide more consistent service for individuals and small groups, but also focus more on our universal peaceful pond cove stuff and the, the assemblies and really kind of beef that up too. So there's a lot of layers that I can explain at a later time if we have more discussions. Um, so if you look at regular education um, classroom teachers, there is a, I'm proposing an addition of a classroom teacher. This year we have 28. So if you remember, this year we have a small group of second graders and a small group of fourth graders. That small group of fourth graders will be going up to the middle school. So now we will only have one small class. So um, going back to six grade four teachers would keep, um, would assure that class size for grade four is in line with budget recommendation, with uh, school board recommendations and guidelines. Um, so due to enrollment, I'm recommending the addition of a teacher, and that would be targeted for grade four. And then, you know, unless it's noted, there are no changes. So the, the, the rest of the classroom teachers, I mean, of course, there's going to be a shift. Grade two will have six teachers, and then grade three will be the small <coughs> class of five. Um, so allied arts, world language, everything else is staying the same. And flip over to the next part of that one pager, um, or two pager, rather. ELL stays the same, gifted and talented. Our support staffs, staff stays the same, except where it says regular ed support <coughs> staff. I have one more proposal and that I'd love to talk to you about. Um, the addition of a consistent um, permanent substitute upon Cove. So right now, of course, we're hiring subs every day from a sub pool. And the idea would be that we could see benefits from securing one person and being able to offer one person, however that's packaged and funded, a more consistent job every day at the school. And they would um, be, be subbing in classrooms every day, but they would know the school really well. Um, if we have um, sub-assignments where we need a particular higher level of skill, we know we can depend on that person and they would be highly trained. Um, so I'm proposing a permanent sub. At Pond Cove. And next, special ed. So, of course, this really is primarily, I'm going to leave it for Dell to talk about, but Dell and I have spoken, and so this is what we are seeing as anticipated special education staff. But I won't get into that. Okay, I'm almost done. So, needs addressed, maintaining appropriate class size through the addition of a classroom teacher. Um, maintain and enhances RTI supports. I do want to talk about that quickly. <coughs> the permanent sub in the building can get us out of a lot of jams, so it's very common to be, to have staff out. We can't find a sub. We pull RTI in text. They don't get the service they need. Um, when we do, then students do not get the RTI service. Then when we pull those texts for a teacher, they're not able to do their duties. So we ask teachers to do their duties. Then they're we, we, um, using planning time. So there's a ripple effect from not having someone there to kind of help us through all these challenges. Um, and I can talk more about that in a later time. So protecting teacher planning time, um, increasing access to guidance services, and um, maintain safety for all for <coughs> students with medical needs. That's referring to the 504. And finally, just I always put in here, needs not addressed. For a couple of years, I've been talking about that learning strategist position at Pond Cove. There are other things that are just more of a priority this year. I just want to keep it, keep it in focus, but it's not. I'm not worried about it right now. The other things are more important. So that is what I have. Great, thank you, Jason. Yes, thank you. Next up is Troy Eastman, principal of the So my packet's a lot smaller. If you took it apart, you'd have three pages. So um, really quickly, I can't
can't believe it's already budget season. It seems like we've kind of just started school, so it always kind of speaks up on us. But I'm going to go down through. I, I had zero new programs last year, so nothing really to report out on. Um, we did create an experiential learning program. I'll talk about that in a minute. But it wasn't really technically a new program. It was at no cost. Um, so I'm just going to go right down through the one pager, which is actually two pages, I believe, in your packet. Um, I just the back. So next year at the middle school, we have, we'll have about 47 fewer students, partly because there's a bubble group leaving eighth grade and a small group coming in um, fourth grade. So about 47 fewer students. Our staffing, um, administrative counseling, academic supports are going to stay the same. And suggesting that we make a reduction of one teacher for next year. So that'll bring us down um, to, I think, 37.5. And I have them broken down here, um, 25 classroom teachers. I don't really need to read it all to you. I'm sure you can read it. But that's, that's what the reduction of one teacher is, one classroom teacher. Um, all the other professional support positions are, are remaining the same with two administrative assistants. Um, our special education staff changed slightly from last year's budget. We actually added two ed techs. Um, so that's reflected here with the 16 total staff. So total staff in the building, um, this current year is 67.55. Next year will be 66.55 is what I'm proposing. With the budget that I've put forth um, the needs that it meets for us and for our students is the continued support um, for response to intervention programming. I think often that gets overlooked, but you know, if someone's struggling and not quite making it in some regular classroom math reading, a step that we have to support them, and quite often it's a successful step, is they go to response to intervention, which meets one, two, three days out of a six-day cycle. And it really is about identifying gaps, filling gaps. Um, and this budget keeps that. We have two of those teachers. Um, we have toyed with the ideas and how to, how to kind of utilize that position. It's, sometimes it can be small group, but um, we've had one that we've had some really good luck pushing into some classrooms. And we have the data that shows that that really made a big impact on not only the kids that we were targeting, but it ended up impacting the whole group. So um, that is, I don't think we ever have the exact model. We're always shooting to hit it. but. That is, has been a huge benefit for us. Um, I think a celebration for our year would be the develop, the we developed and, and started the experiential learning team for our eighth grade. And it was really an effort to um, kind of do a bunch of things for our kids. And in A, they're going to be responsible for learning the same curriculum that everybody else is learning in eighth grade. How they learn it and what time of year they learn it might be slightly different. And math is kind of the only thing that is really a hard thing to schedule into there, so math is, um, these kids are everywhere. We have some kids in geometry, some in algebra, some at the high school, like we have them all over the place for math. Um, so that's not really as closely tied to it, but some experiential learning, I just, I, we just received a nice letter from um, a company in Maine that we've been partnering a lot. The experiential learning teams are reaching out into the community and partner with local businesses. And we got a beautiful letter from one saying um, how impressed they were with the, with the presentation that a couple of our young ladies on our team made and um, how professional they were and, and well like versed in what they were the material they were presenting and some of their ideas were the first time they really brought up to that that group and so those that's one example of how we're reaching out into the community through that team uh, and it's been it's been a huge success it also we've seen an improvement in some attendance for some of the students that were uh, last year struggling a little bit with attendance, and this year we've seen some improvement as a result of that, and it's kind of because it's a smaller group, it's kind of a little family. It's not smaller in class size, like 26, but there's a couple of teachers that rotate in for support throughout the day. And I think that family feeling is what really is kind of, you notice it if you're not there that day. You notice um, a little bit quicker. So I think that's been very helpful. <laughs> And really, the, the, the major goal that we had was for our students to really develop a strong understanding of who they were as learners. What do they need? What are, they, what are their strengths? What are their weaknesses? How can they become advocates for themselves? Because that doesn't, the value of a program shouldn't depend on if there's a sister or, or a brother program at the next school. So it needs to make our students more prepared to be successful wherever they go to school next. And that really has been the underlying driving force of that. So 
I think the kids know that, they've known it going in, and, and they're starting to really kind of dig in and understand that, that um, they need to be their best advocates and know what they need. So that really is a goal of that team. What this budget does is it allows us, we have it planned at no additional cost to expand to a seventh grade um, experiential learning team as well, kind of in conjunction. It'll be slight partners. Some things they'll partner with the eighth grade team, some not. But um, So that is, that is embedded in this budget. The budget also takes into account our desire to try to update two classrooms. Last year we were able to update one. And if you walk through the building, it would take you only one trip through to identify the one. So, uh, you know, and it actually gets to the point where everybody else says, how come I didn't get that? So it's, it's nice, it's, it, it's, it brings a little energy back to those rooms that, um, that need it. There's some tired, tired material, equipment there. Um, we started elective, elective offerings this year. During WIN, we you know, talked to a lot of our eighth grade students and by the time eighth grade comes, you're really kind of burned out a little bit at the middle school. You've been there for four years, you've had the same teachers. The same. You're almost treated like fifth graders a little bit. So we started electives um, during WIN because we realized through our teacher observations, a lot of kids may be a little bit off task in their classrooms during the lesson because that might be when they were with some of their friends. But they know that they go to WIN and they need something to do, so then they're just bang out there working with. So we decided if we make win a, a more appealing option, that they may work harder in classes to make sure that work was done, whatever they could, and then during win they could go do some preferred activity stuff. And that has been pretty successful. Um, students have to be in good academic or social standing in order to attend. So, yeah, and that also has been a pretty nice carrot to make sure that people are not old work or else they would be claimed. So that this. Uh, we kind of did that with no budget, and I've embedded a little bit of money in here to help kind of fund that now. We've realized there are some needs that we have if we want to offer some of the, some of the stuff that we want to offer. Uh, so that's in there. Transportation costs, every year it seems like we are always slightly off on transportation costs, so this year I embedded, put some money in there for transportation. We never get our last bill really until summer, so it's always kind of hard to make sure everything balances out that way, so we've actually put a line in for our transportation costs to increase a little bit. The other thing that I've <clears throat> really taken pride in is when we go to SEAF or when we go to uh, the Parents Association for some, some financial assistance or help, it really is given out pretty freely and I think the expectation is then if it's important to you, you start to budget for it yourself. And so you're not always going back for the same thing. And in trying to stay true to that, we've I put the, the Spirit Series in our budget again. Um, Last year it got cut. We we're doing it kind of a little bit less expensively this year with not really reaching as many kids as we would like. But I put it back into the budget again. I think it shows good faith when you go to ask C for money for the, for the Parents Association that you're actually trying to follow through and pick that bill up because it's that important. Um, another example of that is our guidance department did through professional services has um, did the Hardy Girls and Boys to Men people that came in and did a presentation for all of our kids. That was funded through SEEF. It was a great success. I'm not going to go back to SEEF. We're going to put it in our budget. So that's, that's it. <coughs> and then lastly, we're going to continue. We're on a three-year rotation, so Caitlin tells me, to replace, I think, three big band instruments that the school owns. Uh, last year we were able to replace one. Might be a xylophone or something this year that she has targeted. Um, so she has some, some instruments that she's targeting. She tells me a three-year process and we'll be kind of caught up to where we should be. And then lastly, I think it's still a huge success is our peer observation opportunities for our staff at no additional cost. So uh, Laura Briggs just came back yesterday and said, just in case I haven't told you lately, that is an awesome thing. Uh, she spent the day at King and came back energized and ready to go and, and it's just, I think it's empowering to see what other people do and to see what you do really well. And so I, I'm really proud of that. Some, what I would call unaddressed needs in this budget continue to be some safety concerns. You know, we've all pretty much identified that a fence along the Scott Dye Road would be very helpful when we have kids outside at recess, picking balls, throwing frisbees, those types of things. Um, the need for some type of an alarm system in the school. The door could be open on the weekend and it might be you know, that's why so many people have to go check all the time. But some type of an alarm system and our cameras are in serious need of updating. You know, we can tell that there was a person <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> but that's about all that we can really tell. <coughs> so hopefully.
hopefully they're wearing an orange sweatshirt or something. Uh, and then the last thing that's unaddressed, and it is one of the SEAF grants, and it was, we, they've got a grant this year for mindfulness, and it's starting to get it out into the, into the classrooms. Didn't really find a good way to put that into our budget yet. We're still trying to kind of wait and see what some of the benefits are of that before we go that next step. But I think I think there's going to be a future need. For that. And then, lastly, big changes in the budget. I tried really hard just to stay in a flat budget, but the supply line it's up six thousand from the approved budget of 1920. <coughs> Not the year 1920, but the year 2019 and 20. And uh, that 6,000 was cut. Two years ago, we cut 12,000 from that line. I got half of it back. Still trying to get that other half back, is really what that is. And professional services is up $10,000, which I just talked about. It's the Spirit Series and the Hardy Girls and Boys to Men. And Equipment is up by $5,000 for that same 2019-2020 budget. And again, that was, that's five of the 10,000 was cut two years ago. We got half of it back. And that's really, the equipment line is really where you get the money to update classrooms. That's largely what that is. So I think with that, I'm done. Next up is... <laughs> I'm going to start with a firm preparing for this that I made the math error on the first page of the cost session summary. So I want to give everybody a corrected perspective. <laughs> can leave your demerits on your own. <laughs> This year, I, I didn't bring my flip charts. Um, <laughs> I know you'll miss them terribly. Um, I'm, I'm thinking there'll be some lasting remembering on sort of student load per teacher and average class size and all that sort of stuff. So that that information is reflected here, but I didn't think I would. I, I thought it would be bad judgment on my part to try to repeat that uh, highly popular presentation. Um, so the theme of my uh, the budget proposal for the high school this year is this. Um, I look back at last year's cost center summary and projections, and we came into this year and staffed the high school from a budgetary staff standpoint. You staff, because that's, that's what I asked you to do, and you're very supportive of it. Um, a staff that really was designed to serve 511 students. Um, in fact, our student population is 529. Um, 530 right right now, um, which was due to a wholly unexpected influx of new families in the Cape Elizabeth, um, many of whom had kids to send to the high school. And next year, um, we are projected to be at 553 students. Um, so from our projection of 511 last year to our projection next year of 553, um, we're up 42 students, so I do have some staff proposals to put in front of you for your consideration uh, to try to address those needs. Um, last year, in anticipation of a reduction in student population, we um, cut out a, a three-fifths math teacher, which we wish we had this year, but we don't. Um, so the class sizes there have increased. Um, we cut out a Latin teacher um, as well, so those kids ended up taking other classes. So um, I don't know if the students who are sitting in the audience or other students notice it, but the class sizes have crept up a little bit um, in the last couple of years um, on average. So we're trying to address that. Um, and, and, and so these budget documents, the purpose of them is to sort of put that into perspective. So I'm not going over the 
first two spreadsheets. Um, I'll, there'll be some information that I'll give to you that'll be pertinent to putting those into perspective, but I'm really starting on the third page of your packet, which is the first page of the cost center review. Um, and so that corrected sheet that I gave, just gave you a replacement for the first page of that cost center review document. <coughs> um, so the position, the new positions that I, I have, I'm proposing to add um, are, first of all, I'm coming back um, again, I think this is the third year or maybe even the fourth year in a row, uh, for a proposal for a regular education literacy support teacher. Um, we have really good support available in the high school for students who struggle with executive skills. Um, we have decent support, um, social work and other support for students who struggle with emotional issues and particularly anxiety, which has been the most, most significant increase in one at the high school and is in fact increasing nationwide. Um, the one area where we don't have support that sometimes we scratch our heads and do the best we can but we don't have a great solution to is regular ed students who struggle with reading. Um, uh, there were a few years where we did have a regular ed reading literacy teacher that made a difference for kids. And so I'm proposing, um, and it's under this category of academic support, I'm proposing a, a three-fifths, 0.6, FTE, FTE literacy teacher, which is the same proposal that was before the board last year, but we just couldn't make happen. Um, the other, n under the category of academic support, the other new position I'm proposing to add, and I'm gonna, I'll come back to it at the end when we go to the new, new position proposal documents, I'll talk about it a little bit more briefly, is a teacher leader position, a part-time teacher leader position. Um, and, and I will explain when I get there. It's largely around coordinating a lot of new programs that we've added at the high school, most of which we've added without any new staffing to support them, and somebody to help, primarily to help the assistant, to work with the assistant principal to do a, a really tighter job in sort of coordinating those support programs that we have in place and would like to expand. Um, so I'll come back to that. And then in terms of regular education classroom teachers, I'm proposing a seven, a um, increase of 0 0.4 for English teachers. Um, I would anticipate that that could translate into a full-time teacher who could do part-time literacy and part-time English, I'm thinking. Um, but that's the proposal at this point. Under math, I'm proposing the re return of the part-time math teacher that we cut last year in anticipation of a much lower student population than we actually have this year, as it turns out. Um, I'm proposing a 0 0.75 increase in science staffing, which would allow teaching three more sections than we currently are able to teach, again, to deal with that issue. Um, and, and I will go into a little bit more detail of all these positions, sort of the specific rationale, um, when we get to the new position proposals. Um, a part-time world language teacher, um, um, and then I am proposing a, it's the next to the last bullet here, it's a to be determined. Um, and what I put down is a 0 0.3 to be determined additional teacher in one of various electives uh, areas depending on what the course centers are. Those elective possibilities would be either social studies um, or computer programming, uh, which is an increasing program we want to support, or the arts. So it, it, uh, we're, early in the, well, we haven't started the course selection process yet, we will next month. So I'll be able to get, as the budget goes through, I'll be able to provide more details to the board about what that might actually look like. Um, then under other support positions, um, Carolyn Young, um, many of you know, she's, she's our um, library and media specialist, and she does an unbelievable job. And, um, she is such a support to teachers and students. And for many years, three or four years ago, we eliminated the support position that had always existed in the library in addition to the, um, in, in addition to the library. Um, so Carolyn came to me and she never comes to me and asks, asks for increases in anything. And she came to me about a month or two ago and said, 
I am swamped in terms of keeping up with the day-to-day -day aspects of running a library in terms of inventory and new books, just helping kids check things out and that sort of stuff. Um, so she has asked me to put in the budget a request for the return of a library aid in the budget. So those are those three positions. Um, and then if you turn to the next page of the, I'm projecting and I, um, I'm projecting the same special education staff. I confess that I didn't connect with Dell to see if that's accurate or not, but I'm sure he'll fill us all in. I should have done that. Um, so then I do have on the, my, my cost center summary um, a little more detail, um, which may reflect a little bit of defensiveness on my part from a couple of years ago. Uh, to try to get at again the myth of the the myth of the um, uh, high school overstaffing that sort of came up a couple years ago. It wasn't called quite that, but um, so our student teacher ratio right now is 13.5 students per teacher, um, and two nearby comparison schools. Our student teacher ratio is identical. It's within a tenth of two nearby comparison schools that, won't, that I, I won't name. Um, and there's a little bit more detail about this in, a, in another document that I have in a little bit. Um, so we are we are not um, overstaffed compared compared to other small, comprehensive, high-performing public high schools in this area. Um, we're right with where everybody else is. Um, evaluation of new positions from 2018 and 19, I didn't have any, um, so that's that. Um, the needs that these, this budget proposal would address are reflecting the needs of um, uh, increasing student population, um, uh, long at adding support for regular education literacy for students who struggle, who are not identified um, as special education students, um, and better coordination of many resources um, that I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, under the unaddressed needs is primarily the physical building needs. Um, my camera system, I can tell people when they're on the camera, when I, they're actually very sharp at the high school. The problem is that only about 20% of the high school can you see. Um, but, but the parts we can see, we can make students out, and they are in some critical parts. And I won't make them public, otherwise these students will start wandering around the... They already know. They probably do already. They probably know better than I do. Um, all right, so in terms of the non-salary budget, there is one very significant number, and I actually, and it, so there is a large increase proposed in, in uh, equipment for um, regular instruction, um, and it represents, and there's a, this is a typo here, it is not $24,732, it is $27,532. Um, computer programming is a program that is growing and we would like to, to support to continue to grow. Um, it, is a it is a constraint on the potential growth of the program if all the classes have to be scheduled in our computer classroom. And there's actually no reason why students can't use laptops for purposes of computer programming, it's just that we don't have the laptops for that. So that is the proposal, the proposal for 12 new laptops and a laptop cart um, to allow computer programming classes to be taught elsewhere than in that classroom right there. Um, then the co-curricular, there is a several thousand dollars, I think it's about seven thousand dollars, this is outside of stipends and those sorts of things, but there's a proposal for about seven thousand dollar increase in dues and fees um, under co-curricular and that is to support um, an eSports um, extracurricular program that started last year and is growing like gangbusters. Um, the main principals association actually just <coughs> mentioned it um, as a interscholastic um, club sport. Um, and there are there are dues and fees for teams who compete in that. So so I proposed some, some things there. The other the other growing program that we have that the current budget doesn't reflect 
is we have a growing quiz bowl program. I think actually some of the students here are part of it, I believe. Um, and Mr. Wagner, who's our Achievement Center coordinator, is working with a group of students and competing in quiz bowls in Maine. And they actually competed in a couple of Massachusetts recently as well. They've been doing very well. So we'd like to be able to support that as well. And, I'll, and now I'll come back to this third bullet point <coughs> in a little bit, because it connects to another document that I have here. OK, so the next document I have, and I'm not going to discuss this in any detail. I just want you to see it. Um, so what I've done is I've given you a list of all of the class sections in the high school, who's teaching them, how many students are in them. Um, so there it is, um, where there are uh, classes that appear to be a little bit low. There's usually an explanation for them, and I've given you that explanation. Um, so all of, all of the numbers are there. Um, and I'm sure at some point the board may have questions about it, but I just wanted to point it out. So for the way this works is um, if you turn to Mr. Jordan. Where's Mr. Jordan? He's, this is, he's on the second page. He's the fourth teacher down. Um, so he teaches, Mr. Jordan teaches five classes, and power school is right, and his class sizes are 16, 17, 21, 19, and 14. Uh, for a total student load for Mr. Jordan this year of 87, um, which is just a little bit shy of the maximum under the school board policy guideline. Okay, so that's the way that works. At any point, I'd be glad to answer any questions about that at some future times. So then if you turn to the next page, um, you'll see my... Um, my desire to have the board fully aware and having the perspective of our class size again. There's a little bit more detail here. Um, it, some of it will ring a bell for the board members who were here last year as well. Um, and again, it's trying to put our class size into perspective. Our average class size this year is higher than it's been. Um, for most of the time that I've been principal here, not a lot, but it's higher. Um, and that's because we cut our staff and we had an unexpected increase in student population. Our student-teacher ratio is identical to what it was last year. Um, and I've given you a list that will look familiar to some of you of high-performing schools that have been recognized among the best high schools in New England um, and what they have, according to U.S. News, for student-teacher ratios. And you can see that we are on the high side um, if you look at most of those schools. And I didn't do any editorializing from those things. I didn't just cherry pick them. These are the ones that are sort of at the top um, in those states comparable to where we are in, in Maine. So, so I, I do think that it, uh, it puts our numbers in, in good perspective. And I, I will say again, and the board has heard me say this every year, that you know, I, I love um, giving tours to families who are considering coming to Cape Elizabeth. And they ask, they always, when they, act, they come, they ask lots of questions that are usually highly individual to their particular student's background or experience. What classes would they be taking and that sort of thing. But the one question, without fail, I, have, oh, I am always asked. Um, is what's the average class size? Um, so if we went up anywhere near what the average class size would be if we were to move our student-teacher ratio close to the EPS formula, the Essential Programs and Services formula, our class size would be far larger than our, um, our comparison schools in the area. Um, without any questions. Um, then on the second page of this document, I've given you some information about um, we do have some teachers who teach fewer than five classes. The normal class load is, is five. We have a number, and I don't think it's a secret thing that the veteran board members that teachers who give <coughs> serve two periods in our achievement center teach four instead of five. Um, so they teach two periods in lieu of having a fifth prep, basically so that they can support students through the Achievement Center. Our science teachers um, who teach classes with labs that are associated with them 
teach four classes as opposed to five because in addition to their core class period, they're also teaching lab sections, which are essentially the equivalent of a fifth, a fifth class. Um, and then I have a little section here that talks about why art and technology classes are a little bit smaller. It's usually because of safety issues or equipment constraints in terms of numbers. Um, and this year we do have a particular issue of our health and PE classes are a little bit small. Um, and there's a reason for that, and it's because we made a mistake in projecting our needs for PE Adventure, um, the number of sections. We should have had two sections of PE Adventure. We projected we would need three because historically PE Adventure starts here and then kids decide to add it. Um, and what's happened this year, for whatever reason, is it started here and we actually had some, some decreases. Um, next semester, the PE adventure is done and the PE teachers are up and the health teachers are up to where they've always been in the past. But right now, Mr. Shea has three very small PE adventure classes. They were not projected to be the size that they turned out to be, but they are the size that they turned out to be. That was a mistake. Um, okay, so if I go on to the new, new programs and positions, um, I've combined the request for an English slash literacy teacher to reflect on one document. I think I've explained the reason for that to really allow us to address the reading difficulties of students who are not identified students. Um, and we have, we have some of those. Um, and we would like to be able to do a better job of supporting them. So that's the purpose of that proposal. And the other part of it is just to address this increased student population. That's the English part of that proposal. Um, the next page is the six-tenths, three-fifths math teacher. So 0 0.6 in the high school is equivalent to three additional classes taught. Um, a full-time teacher teaches five, so this would allow us to teach three additional sections compared to what we do right now. Um, depending on how the course sign-up goes, it might allow us to put a have a little bit more coverage of math teachers in the achievement center, because this year we had to reduce that in order to address some of the, some of the concerns about class sizes. The next page is about the uh, 0.75 science teacher edition. So, this also, even though the FTE is different, um, it, is, it represents a request to hire a teacher to teach, to teachers to teach three additional sections of science as well. It's just that with the additional lab time that gets associated with that as well, three additional sections in science is 0.75, three additional sections of everything else is 0.6. So that's where that comes from, if that makes sense. Um, all right, so the teacher leader position, uh, this one I want to explain just a little bit. So I would say that over the past 10 years, um, if you if you would begin with the Achievement Center, we'd go even farther back. But in addition to talking about class sizes to teachers, one of the things that I always make a point of when I'm um, bringing new pers prospective families around the school is I... I, I can probably and accurately say that I think we do a really, really, we have a lot of resources to support students who need extra support. Um, and we have increased those significantly. And we have honored alternative pathways, the desire to provide alternative pathways for kids. I am proud of the fact that in the last three years, our enrollment at PATS has more than tripled. Um, I think that's really great. Um, we're now offering three dual enrollment sections, so that's kids who are concurrently enrolled in a high school class, which offers both high school and college credit. Um, we have increasing numbers of students taking online courses for any number of reasons. Um, our, we have added, our obviously, our student-driven learning program. Um, we have academic skills to support students. In the past few years, under the leadership of Mr. Carpenter, we started off offering one section of Freshman Academy. We're now up to three sections of Freshman Academy. And, and Mr. Carpenter just led the creation of a section of Sophomore Academy because he just, just identified some sophomores who had been in Freshman Academy in the past and they were not going in the right direction this year and they needed some more support, so we organized some supports for those kids. 
Um, and, and I think there's more that we would like to do in terms of alternative pathways. Um, it would be really helpful, and my, my, the vision is, um, to have somebody to work closely with Nate Carpenter, for whom this is a true passion and a huge strength, and has just had, created enormous dividends for the school, to work closely with him to sort of coordinate these alternative pathways, these creative pathways for kids, so we can add even more of those. So the idea would be to have a teacher be a part-time teacher, part-time teacher leader, not administrator, not part-time administrator, but part-time teacher leader. So the proposal is not for evaluative responsibilities or anything like that. It's really a teacher who's interested in exploring leadership um, and developing their leadership capacity um, and providing some leadership in some really critical directions where we, in conjunction, in cooperation with Mr. Carpenter, where I think we can really tighten and expand opportunities for students. Um, so that's the teacher leadership position. I think I said everything I want to about that. Um, so the next page is the high school library aid. I think I've explained that. Um, Carolyn being Carolyn, there's like lots of data in here and lots of statistics about the number of media, the number of new resources, and all that sort of stuff. I'm not going to go through all that. It's pretty self-explanatory. Um, I will say that this proposal, and Carolyn just presented this to me, it speaks to the issue. Um, she's, she's got really high standards for herself. She's super detail-oriented, and, and I want to support her. Um, so the next one is, and I do want to talk about this just a little bit, a part-time for introductory French. We have not been able to offer students a French one experience at the high school for many, many years. Um, and we would like to be able to do that. Um, and it would serve the needs of two groups of kids. It would serve the needs of kids who have gone through this, the system um, at the elementary and middle school and have gotten, gotten some basic understanding of French, but they're not up at the level of level two. Um, because what tends to happen with those kids, if they're overplaced in level two, they can survive level two. They will struggle like crazy in level three. And many of them will stop their study of world language after level three. And we would like to see all of our kids take a foreign language every single year, even though it's not a graduation requirement. Um, the other group of kids that it will serve are the really, 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 the kids who are really passionate about world language and would like to take a second world language. Um, and right now we don't have anything to serve them. We do it if they're taking French and they want to go to Spanish, because we do have Spanish one. We have not been able to staff French one. So we don't have anything to serve the Spanish kids who are passionate about foreign language who would like to start a second foreign language. Then the next one is the to be identified at some point, um, a part-time position to, for an elective program. This is my guess, is that we're going we're gonna to need that with the number of in, with the increased number of kids we have. It's just hard to predict um, for the elective classes exactly where kids are going to land before we ask them to land somewhere. Um, and the next document is the laptops. Um, it, it explains that, but I think I've already explained it, and this document has the accurate number, so you don't have to make a correction there. Um, and then the last document that I have, and, and then I'm done, is there are a n number of... Jeff, can I just make a comment? Ours says it's 24,732. Yeah, that's where I made the mistake. Right, so it doesn't have the accurate number. I just want to clarify. It's 27... Yeah, five I just... 30. Oh, I'm sorry. 27, 5, 30. Yeah, I just want to make sure that board numbers are clear. Enough. My mistake. Thank yeah. you. So there are a number of... Well, there's been... There have been a lot of new co-curricular programs added in the high school over the last two, three years. Um, this is not a comprehensive list of all of them. 
this is a comp this is a small list of those I think that involve the most time um, that do not have stipends that reflect the time that teachers and staff members are now volunteering to make these activities possible. Um, and so I'm at the superintendent's request, I'm gathering some information about the hours that certain positions take and that that's going to go to the board. The only purpose of this document is to have it still be on the radar somewhere and those are to be worked out. Um, and I think that those are all pretty self-explanatory. They're just at some point, I think, through negotiations, potentially requests for new or increased stipends for particular areas. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. Um, <coughs> you see, my document is just a big document. <laughs> so I got you down. <laughs> Even without the chart. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to start off the number of students that were serving in some publication. Um, a total of 171, that's 52 at Pond Cove, 67 at middle school, and 52 at the high school. Um, with regard to staffing, I'm not looking to make any significant changes to the staffing levels that we have with regard to teachers, therapists, ed techs, uh, and psychologists. Um, the only addition would be one new uh, ed tech two position at Pond Cove, and the reason for that is uh, the number of incoming students uh, through CDS. Uh, Jason and I have already met with uh, Child Development Services, which is the preschool equivalent to the special education, and so we've got an idea of students that will be coming in in the fall, and so that was the re why that request was made. Um, the other piece uh, I'd like to point out is, if you'll notice, uh, the current outplaced number has moved from two to three now. So we have three students that are outplaced at special purpose private schools. And that has, um, is an increase. And because of that increase, we have shifted, uh, we had a social work position that was in the local entitlement grant. That's the federal funds that we received. And that was pulled out of the local entitlement grant and put into the regular budget. And you'll see that bubble um, and with regards to the K through eight social work service, uh, social work line. But um, and the reason for that is so that we did um, a lot more of the local entitlement grant to cover those areas. Um, and that covers mo most of the additional costs. Um, and I just want to remind the, the uh, board that all, pro all professional development, three of the ed tech threes, salaries and benefits, uh, the outplaced students, and the technology needs, <coughs> special education software, audiologist services, and the majority of supplies are in the local entitlement grant. This year's local entitlement grant was $375,210. And then the second page is the line by lines. And so if you'll, uh, I just want to speak to the ones that uh, certainly would stand out to me as a board member if I was looking at it. And mm -hmm. that would include the social worker K through eight, which has a 66% increase. And that's the, because we pulled that uh, social work salary and benefits. The social worker that is already employed with us, but now will be paid through local funds versus local entitlement. Um, we have uh, enough, uh, the overall increase is 7%. There is one decrease, and that was we were able to decrease the cost of the extended school year K through 8 because we were able to do that uh, for less than we budgeted last year. Thank you. No. I have to beat that time. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm you timing you all on the record. Technology. He's got a show and tell for us. Well, I have a show and tell, but I didn't want to oh, put sorry. the iPad in there, so you know it would take too much time mm -hmm. and so on and so forth. 
Well, thank you for inviting me. Um, uh, the proposed uh, technology part of the 2020 21 budget uh, reflects that there is no additions or subtractions from the staff of technology. Um, we have uh, uh, so reflected uh, very conservative but also meeting the needs of what we, um, we need to make sure that we're updated and, and staying current. Um, some of the highlights, uh, for example, in, in uh, Pond Cove, there's a $25 or $26,000 or $26, increase because we're going to replace the uh, laptops for the staff with a new lease from Apple. And so that's reflected and that's what that has gone up. Um, as far as the middle school, what's happening this year is MILTI, which is um, a government, a state gov main state government program that was introduced with Steve, uh, Governor King um, to make sure that there was all kinds of um, technology for 7th and 8th grade. Um, this year they're going to do a bridge year, which basically means that um, they're not quite, you know, they're trying to determine where they're going to take that program. So they have left... Um, when, they left the uh, old equipment in place for one more year with no cost or anything. And so that's why we have a decrease on, in, <clears throat> at the middle school as far as technology. Um, as far as the high school goes, uh, we have retired a three-year uh, lease from Apple um, for the first uh, wave of iPads, and that was $100,000. $100, um, as you know, uh, what we try and do is at the high school, is every incoming freshman gets a new device, and they carry that device through four years. At senior year, what the seniors do um, is we turn the device and we bring them down to the lower levels. So we keep repurposing all that. Um, so we have currently, and we continue to support a one-to-one -one device from third grade all the way up to 12th grade. And then the lower grades, there's sometimes um, we have uh, 10 devices or a two to one uh, ratio. Um, other than that, looking for, you know, as you can see with the numbers, I'm, I'm pretty uh, conservative. There's nothing really going up or down. It's just a balance, balancing act to say, okay, this year I need a little bit more licenses for our MDM, which manage all the devices and so on and so forth and I might not need as, as much network equipment. And so I rob Paul, pay for Peter, or whatever you want to call it. And that's basically it. Oh, besides the new, two new pro no, proposals, I have to talk about them, don't I? All right. Well, the first proposal is uh, putting a uh, new projector system and audio system in the band room. Um, if you go down to the band room and, and take a look at the equipment that they have for that size room, it is grossly understaffed, um, especially if you're playing the xylophone, you're in the back row and so on. So I don't know why they stick the xylophone in the back row, you know, but uh, it, they have a hard time looking at the projector on the screen. On, uh, it's very small and the sound is very, very weak. And it's a very large room, so it's very um, under, under, uh, uh, undersized. So that, uh, we went and got a local vendor to give us a run through with the uh, proposal, and that's what you'll see the, I think it was about $21,000 that I'm um, asking for that type of program. Uh, again, if, if it makes the budget and so on and so forth, we'll get more than one vendor to give us a, a rough estimate. The second one is my show and tell. Um, in the corner there is a double robot. Um, and what we did was we were very fortunate. Um, Waterboro uh, school system let us borrow it for two year, two weeks. I wish two years. For two weeks, tonight's the last, uh, last time we can borrow it. I have to return it tomorrow. And what that does is it allows a student who is, um, cannot attend school for a long period of time. And it can actually move around into the different classrooms. The student actually um, drives it using um, her laptop, her iPad, or a tablet, or even a smart, smartphone. And, it, and she could uh, lower or, or um, raise or lower the uh, 
to the screen and move the screen left and right. So instead of just a stagmented iPad doing FaceTime and so on and so forth, which works, this is a more um, robust and more enriched learning environment to do it. So we pro I propose um, having one in there. Uh, we took it and we went through the high school, um, through all the corridors and in, in between all uh, some of the classes that were changing, which was kind of interesting. Um, the only place that we ever lost a connection to it was at, in the elevator when the elevator door shut. Um, and we took it to Pond Cove where it worked very well and in the middle school it also worked very well. So, so those are the two new proposals. Do they have them? It has uh, the, bot the base of it is like a Segway, so it automatically um, balances itself. And that's an older unit, and there's an iPad that goes in there, but now it's integrated with their own screen, which has their own microphone and their own um, um, video capabilities to it. <clears throat> and the other thing that the newer one does is the student doesn't, uh, right now the student would have to use the arrow keys on the keyboard to move it around. But in the new one, they just point to a direction and it automatically follows that path to the direction. So there's a, less, a lot less moving it around, so on and so forth. It is a bit slow. Um, I, either that or I walk very fast, um, <laughs> which is probably true. But uh, it's a little bit slow and so on and so forth. So I, you know, I suggested to, <clears throat> to the, the middle school that we'd have to uh, readjust to as bell times to go from class to class. Um, he's not too happy about Hall that. Monitor, right? Hall monitor. monitor and stuff like that. But it really is a, another way to engage the students who unfortunately have to be home and can t attend one of your class. And those are my two proposals. Now I'm done. Okay. Thank you, Thank you, Noel. Thank you, Harry. Yeah. Thank you, transportation. All right. I have a page as well to add to my package. It's kind of just a summary of what I was looking at for capital improvements for the uh, upcoming year. Uh, I'd like to th thank you to the board for having me here. Um, thank you for taxpayers for supporting school. And thank you to my staff as well. Um, for the most part, the numbers within my budget that are up are solely due to increasing the facilities uh, maintenance needs for each building due to the repairs that uh, I'll say historically this year has been a, a, a trouble for the middle school in Pond Cove specifically but we're feeling it in all areas in, in each building um, something as early as this morning we had a uh, we came into the middle school in Pond Cove with a, a 58 degree temperature within the building that uh, we had to jump on fairly quick and what had happened was an air handler over the walk-in coolers in the kitchen had a burst coil allowing all the water and the heating system to go down into the walk-in cooler and freezer. Um, thank you for Peter and his crew for tackling that end of the project. Um, we got the coil repaired, uh, got the system charged back up, the heat was back on. It always could be done a little quicker, but it was, it was up fairly quick. And uh, we're hopefully moving forward, but that's that's the things we're running into. It seems to be uh, middle school in Pond Cove seem to be a little jinx this year. <laughs> um, so I've I've increased those lines according to what we're running into historically, and just kind of bumping up and preparing. Um, what we've done this year is I had some money set in equipment lines to purchase floor scrubbers and things like that. Thankfully, our floor scrubbers are holding out, so uh, Marcy was able to move funds from equipment lines to help cover these other lines that are slowly going over. Um, and, and the other increase that, that shows, because I believe I have the largest percentage out of everybody, was also due to the uh, taking the capital improvements line back to the $500,000 mark, which is what it was when I came here. Um, I'm open to increasing that. <laughs> but I, I, I think we all know there's, there's a lot more meetings within the facilities end of it to see where we're going in the future. So I'm just kind of, the, the capital improvements list I have here, I'm just kind of, this is what I've been given by principals as needs. Um, staff member requests, things that I've seen. There is 
a line in here uh, for a large amount of security work to be done here, and, and that is uh, electronic locks and security cameras as well. So I think we're, I might have been mind reading the principles a little bit on that one. <laughs> um, my, my first, the first page that I submitted for my packet is really just a summary of our department. I, I just want to remind everybody that we fall under the one town concept and that we, we serve more than just the schools on a daily basis. Um, I believe Cape Elizabeth is uh, 46 square miles and within that we serve 47 different structures including all of Fort Williams and the Portland Headlight. Um, some highlights, um, our school buses do roughly about 112,000 miles in the last year. Uh, custodial staff sets up about 525 different event setups. This would be considered an event setup. Um, three schools, five town buildings cleaned by the night, night custodians, and um, over, a little over a thousand work requests completed by our maintenance staff. And again, that is town wide, not just within the school. Uh, a little summary of what our staff currently looks like today and how that breaks out. On the next page, I, I actually have four <coughs> requests for physicians, and some of this is due to trying to prepare the department not only to grow, but to help cover. I have a large, well, to me, a, a very important part of my staff retiring this year. Um, to two of, well, basically our bus scheduler. Um, my administrative assistant, who also oversees the custodial staff. Um, I'm losing a van driver, and I'm losing a maintenance person. I mean, everybody's retiring. Um, so I'm trying to prepare our department for that, and I've always kind of, due to, due to the size of what we have to cover, I consider our, our facilities department more sized for a school district when it should be a little more going in the direction of uh, the college campus due to the amount of what we have to cover. So the first request I have is for an additional maintenance person that would serve in a night position. And basically they would come on roughly around the same time as what the custodians do, and that's around 2.30. And they would cover the night, um, Monday through Friday, and that would help with uh, that the night maintenance person that's retiring is, is Bernie Shannon, and I've been fortunate enough that he basically lives right on the other side of the sand pit here, very close to the school. I can call him 2 o'clock in the morning, get him up out of bed, and unusually willing to come in. <laughs> and, and that's one of the things I'm going to miss. So I'm trying to help also with, with adding to the maintenance crew, but to help cover that bracket of, of night hours where most of us go home, but the, the, the town buildings and the school buildings still continue to run until 10 or 11 o'clock at night. So it, it also gives us the ability to cover places that are difficult to get into uh, during a day, like a classroom or maybe a certain office or things like that. It would give us the ability to get projects done in those areas. Uh, the second position, this, this is more on the town side. Um, but I'm looking for another uh, custodian to fill in. That would be solely just for the town buildings. Um, this particular submission is only in here because I believe that as it's written, they're an employee of the school, but we are reimbursed by the town for their services. So this position here would be solely dedicated to the town buildings, the five that we clean at night. I just need additional help within those buildings and try to get close to one person in each one of those buildings. Um, the difficulty on the town side is really due to their later hours of operation. Uh, the next one is for a facilities custodian on the school side. Um, that, that again is just to help increase the staff that we have and the demands that are, are, are on our staff altogether. Um, the, the actual location of this, 
I haven't figured that out yet. I think it's going to be more of a floater position. What we're running into is when, when we're fully staffed, thing, things are pretty good. But um, it, I'll say, unfortunately, it's a rarity that we're fully staffed um, due to vacations, uh, personal days, sick time, whatever. There, there's always this, this link missing every night, and it's a huge burden on the remaining staff that's here to try to tow that line. Um, a, a custodian might cover a, like a wing of a building. So when that custodian's not here, the rest of the crew has to then fill in and try to get that wing of that building maintained to a point where it's ready for school the next day. And the uh, last one is, I'm calling it a facilities project manager. Um, it it's, could be labeled as an assistant to my position. Um, this would be billed both on the town and school would be a shared expense. And that's really to, my focus is, they, they would serve as, as an assistant in, in my absence, but it would also be to help with overseeing construction projects. And the, the ability to have more time to accurately uh, bid things out the way we should. Um, it's not so much a problem on the town, on the school side, because the school has a, a fairly substantial amount that we um, are allowed to spend before we have to put it out to bid. On the town side, I'm working with the town manager to get it increased, but it is very low, and it is very difficult. It's it's thirty five hundred dollars. Pretty much everything I do every day is more than thirty five hundred dollars. So. <laughs> um, it's been pointed out a couple times, and, and I've asked that they increase this. So we're, we're working that out. But, um, for instance, the playground that the school did this past summer, due to the, my current workload, I was only able to visit that project maybe three or four times while it was being done. And uh, something of that scale, uh, even, a, even a smaller project, but something of that scale, should be visited almost daily just to see that everything's being done properly and, and, and the way it's uh, written on the blueprints. So I, I'm just looking to add to that position. And again, this also is going to take away from some of the Janet Hoskins, my current assistant. Uh, she's got 30 plus years of institutional knowledge here. And uh, when she retires, that's a huge portion of that going away. Um, so this person would also fill a little bit of that void. Um, and I think, oh, I'm sorry, one more thing. Uh, as part of a capital improvement, we were told by the Public Works Department that services our vehicles, that they will no longer uh, inspect one of our vans. It is in such bad shape, they don't want to put their name on it anymore. Uh, I unfortunately at the end of last week that particular van lost its power steering pump so it's currently in a garage getting that done so we can at least get it for the remainder of the school year um, but we're, we're now at a point where we're looking to replace that vehicle and uh, get something newer for our fleet that that vehicle will be disposed of I don't even think it's worthy of some I can run through the capital improvements or wait until any Q&A later. It's up to you guys. Okay. I think there's time. Yep, okay. And I think it's important. All right, Pond Cove. We're looking at painting. It's the year. This, this is an annual thing we do every year. We, we pick a wing or a grade and we uh, tackle the classrooms and try to freshen them up. So in Pine Cove, we have the painting of the second grade classrooms, and that would also be new shades within the windows. That comes to $22,000. That's based on a historical pr price for painting the classrooms over the past couple of years. Replacement of the stair treads and, and ramp area, handicap ramp, uh, leading between the third grade and fourth grade areas. Um, that's just due to wear and tear. Those rubber treads are at the end of their life. 
Um, Jason and I have talked about the possibility of uh, his school is in need of an extra office space, so we're eyeing up an area similar to like what we did at the middle school where there's a kind of a dead end corridor that we were able to put a doorway in and actually has a window and it actually, it's a fairly good location for one um, and convert that into an office for their needs. Um, exterior door and hardware security grid upgrades, that's just kind of a general, uh, what my staff and I want to do is really go through the buildings this summer and address some of the, some of the things that have been pointed out. Uh, Rob McVeigh, our, our uh, maintenance supervisor, was able to attend one of the lockdowns at the middle school in Pond Cove and um, we found a few things that are, that are in need and now that they've been brought to our attention, we would like to tackle them in a more permanent solution um, this summer. Uh, whiteboard replacement project. Um, that's just something Jason and I have been talking about. They're looking to convert, uh, to move away from the, I'm sorry, what are they called? Chalkboards and, and uh, smartboards. Smartboards. Uh, the chalkboards and smartboards and go to a whiteboard installation and that would also have camera projector abilities that would go onto the whiteboard. Um, new carpet and VC, VCB, that's Vinyl Cove based in the conference room. Um, that's just a request that Jason's had and, and, and I agree the, con the conference room's a little bit of a little bit of an echo chamber right now. So uh, just an additional adding carpet to that space to help quiet it down. In the Cape Elizabeth Middle School uh, there's, this has been an ongoing project that I've been dealing with with Siemens, our mechanical contractor, and we have some upgrades that need to be done within that boiler room to get it functioning, I'll say, a little better than what it does now. It's, 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 recently it's been kind of unpredictable, and um, we, we found some areas that need improvement with controls and things like that, and uh, some of the boiler stacks that have issues so th this price is just looking to do upgrades <coughs> and repairs within that space. <clears throat> uh, replacement of a six inch shutoff valve, that's just a valve that no longer closes and we needed the, the capability for it to close. That's on the heating system. Painting of the eighth grade classrooms, again, that's just a uh, summertime maintenance that we do within that building. Bleacher reinforcement for safety code, that was pointed out by Hussey Seating when they did their inspection that we, um, just due to the age of the bleachers and their style, uh, there's a brace that they can put in to help just kind of reassure that those bleachers will be able to take the full weight load that they are designed to hold. Right now, it's questionable. Exterior door, and again, exterior door and hardware security upgrades, that's just going around the building. Uh, 21,000 looks like a substantial number, but that would get you about one and a half doorways if we needed to replace an entire, entire doorway. That would be like a double set of doors, a six foot wide opening. <clears throat> uh, installation of a new sink in nurse's office. Uh, some might remember I had that in last year's capital improvements budget. Due to a safety concern that we had in the Pond Cove, like Noel, I had to take from Peter to pay Paul. Uh, unfortunately, the nurses sink, that's where the money came from, um, just due to it not being as high of a priority. So I made a promise to the, the nurse and Troy that that would go back in and, and get done. So uh, that's why that is in here again this year. And then resetting of the failing precast window sills. That is something that was pointed out by Colby Company as one of the needs, and that's the precast concrete underneath the windows in the wing closest to the playground in the middle school. It kind Seven of bumps years. out. Um, and it, you can just simply walk by and you'll see they're just kind of sitting there allowing water to get in. And we have had, um, thankfully knock on wood, not too bad, but we have had many moisture penetration in those classrooms in some <coughs> areas. Definitely could be worse than what it is, but it, it's, it's something that has to be corrected. Um, Cape Elizabeth High School, new glass door installation in the library. This is something that 
Jeff Shedd's staff had brought to my attention, but when we get into a security lockdown, it, it's difficult to secure the library. With those, those doors might be locked, but the classrooms or the staff room or anything on any size, if there's nobody there to secure those spaces, the library is then not secure. So we're looking at basically doing a set of doors where the carpet ends. That the library staff, if we go to a lockdown situation, could secure this area. And, and it, it might not even be for a lockdown. It might just be for a security thing where they want to use that end of the, the hallway or the computer lab, but still keep, keep, be able to keep kids out of the library. So it's just having that extra security for this area. Um, that would probably just be a, a full set of glass solid glass doors. <clears throat> uh, continued window replacement, that's an annual thing that we've been doing in this building, and that's just the aluminum framed windows. Um, we, every year we pick up a few classrooms, maybe six classrooms, and we pop out what is already in there and put new ones in. Um, that is not just due to any type of R value that we're getting from the windows or it's, it's more than just the quality of the window. We've been getting water penetration, um, actually ruining walls within the classrooms underneath the windows. I, the Wynn's classroom was one last year that was done where it was, it, it's pretty bad looking when you, when you see it prior to the window going in. Uh, new carpet and VCB in the main office. That is Jeff Shedd's entire main office that includes the assistant principal, the main desk area, um, Jeff Thorick's area. It's, uh, the, the carpet there is just at the end of its life. They had done a patch at some point where, where Jones sits, um, but the other area was never addressed, so we're looking to pull everything out of that room. And, and, and when these prices are more than just anything here that's carpet related is more than just the square footage of the room the contractor quotes me a price for removal of all furniture and everything to take it all out and put it back in because our staff is busy doing waxing floors and things like that during the summer so I have them handle moving all furniture and disconnecting things. Uh, installation of underground electric to the stadium concession stand. That was something that was pointed out by the insurance company. Um, currently we run two extension cords no safety hazard the, w the way it's done, but the insurance company would like to see it a little more permanent. So it's digging a trench over to the, over to the concession stand and putting an actual small breaker panel in the concession stand and just wiring it up appropriately. Uh, exterior door and hardware security upgrades. That just goes right through with the entire school campus. Interior paint improvements. I don't typically with the high school. I go by what I see. Um, I mean, I know the the high school here. The stairwells are kind of ugly right now, but um, I also go by anything that Jeff reports to me that might be need to be addressed in a classroom or anything like that. So that's more of just a budget number for that ten thousand dollars. <laughs> Carpet and VCB in the occupational therapist's workspace. That is a room just off of the staff room area. Again, just carpets come to the end of its life and it just needs replacement. And new carpet in the chorus room. That is for acoustics. Um, they currently have more solid walls, a solid floor, a solid ceiling. <laughs> So we're just trying to improve acoustics in there by, by getting something on the floor to absorb some of the echo. Uh, Campus-wide. Replacement of the utility van. I told you guys about that in my uh, request. Security upgrades with electric locks, servers, and cameras. Um, I, have a, I have a few locations <coughs> that I know of that need to be need addressing with with cameras in particular um, but I know there's quite a bit more and it's something that I would like to sit down with with each principal and go over what they're looking for in your school or, or, or where they're seeing the most problem before I go and decide where I think the things should be um, but 
and and with that, and then Noel knows I've been talking to him a while for a while now. The um, we we might have to do a server upgrade because our servers are coming to the end of their useful life, and uh, I can we need to upgrade to a Windows 10 system and. Noel knows more about it. <laughs> I, I hand that part off to Noel a little bit, and um, we're going we're gonna to try to save some money in possibly buying the equipment ourselves and, and doing that part of the installation ourselves and not allowing the uh, contractor to put a 10 or 20 percent markup on that. So we're working together on that one. And uh, phone system server upgrades. <clears throat> this is a new one that's a hot topic here in the high school. We are currently dealing with our phone system continually crashing probably numerous times per day right now. Um, I would love to bump this up to possibly this year, but I don't know if the funds are there, and that's only due to the um, uncomfortable situation that Jeff's staff is going through where they're in the middle of a phone call or something and the phone just cuts out. Or... Um, you know, a parent might be trying to call the school here and sometimes is unable to contact the front desk. Uh, we believe that right now all the controls, or, or I'll say the brain of the system is in the middle school. <clears throat> and it communicates to the high school through fiber optics. We believe everything with that line is, is good. It's doing everything it needs to. And those guys would know there would be other problems within the network itself if, if there was a problem with that. So we know it's phone related. Um, the company that we have is NEC Phones and this particular equipment is no longer, they're not, they're not uh, uh, any uh, supported any longer. So we now have to bump up our system and that is the cost of that price is to bump up the system with some server, phone server upgrades. And uh, it would also allow the ability to, anytime somebody leaves a voicemail for uh, here at the high school, they call a teacher and leave a voicemail for them, it actually goes to the middle school because that's the brain. I want to separate the two schools so the high school has its own voicemail and middle school in Pond Cove has their own voicemail. I don't know why it was set up that way. but. <laughs> So that, that's all included in that price. That's it. Thank you, Karen. So with your permission, yes, absolutely, Kathy, I, we've made it more than halfway through the list for tonight. And so um, it might be nice to take a five-minute break right now. I mean, I got facilities and then... We'll come back with Kathy Stanford. Okay. Oh, you yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. I have here from Kathy. He's all business. He's business. I know. I feel like I'm going to be business. Here's Dark. Less expensive. Okay, Kathy. All right. I'm going to start. Yeah. 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 I'm going to provide an overview of four cost centers, the improvement of instruction, English learner, gifted and talented, and volunteer services cost centers, and these, all of the information you need on, on one page. Um, so the improvement of instruction accounts, these include funding for the summer curriculum work that, um, that our educators make extensive use of. We've budgeted $15,000 per school. Um, for at least the last four years, and we're recommending that remain stable. Last summer, we supported 59 projects. Mm. That account also includes the school year professional development and travel, and we arrived at the number by um, giving each staff member uh, $350, $250 for the professional development itself, and then $100 for the related travel expenses, although we're, we're flexible around that. But that's that's how we arrive at that figure, is $350 per staff member. Um, this account also includes uh, money for course reimbursement. It's available to teachers and ed techs, and the exact number of credits that is supported depends on the provisions of the collective bargaining. 
Um, we also have money set aside for certification committee members, evaluation committee members, and then peer mentors. These are all DOE requirements, and the specific stipends are negotiated um, through the, uh, in the collective bargaining agreement, specified there. And then finally, we have in this account, in this cost center, our universal screeners and standardized assessments. Um, new this year is the APPLE, which stands for the APPLE Assessment of Performance Toward Proficiency in Languages. And I wrote it down because I've not yet been able to commit it to memory. Um, but this is the assessment that our um, upper level French and Spanish students are taking. And um, if they earn a particular score on that, then they will be eligible to apply for the seal of biliteracy. So, um, and we have um, given that assessment this year, and I understand that our students have done very well, and we expect that a number of them then will, will be awarded that seal, and we're really excited about that. And then as well, we um, budget through this cost center um, on the online software program I excel that those of you who are parents are very familiar with and that is for skills practice. So that's the improvement of instruction cost center, then the English Learners Cost Center. This is divided into K8 and 912. Oh and I should add about the improvement of instruction that overall those overall accounts are up thirty seven hundred dollars in the FY twenty one budget proposal. Okay, English learners. So this includes funding for two half-time English learner teachers and their associate expenses. Um, I'll talk about that in a second. And then also uh, interpreter services and um, books and supplies, which we have put more money into the books account this year. In fact, we introduced a books account this year. Um, that's a, with new personnel. Um, as well as the um, increase in the students we're servicing, we, we're, we just, we're finding that we really need to upgrade our instructional materials, and so, um, so the increase in our cost center will reflect that. Um, we have 22 English learners in grades K through 12. And then the position, I'll just talk a bit about that. So um, in the 2017-2018 school year, we budgeted for a 0.5 English EL teacher. Um, and then midway through that year, we increased that to a 0.8 um, because we had new families move in and we wanted to support their children. Um, and we started off this year with a 0 0.8, but then in October had to hire, um, had to increase that position from a 0.8 to a 1.0. Um, again, because of um, increased needs in families moving in. And uh, it was recommended and we agreed that rather than having one teacher in three schools, that we have two half-time teachers. So we have a teacher at Han Cove and a teacher um, who works with the middle and high school students. And there is, it's kind of a combination evaluation of the increase to 0 0.8 and then a, an explanation of why we're increasing to 1.0 attached to my, um, to my report, which should be okay. Okay, so overall we're looking at an increase of $8,500 for the English Learners Cost Center. Then the Gifted and Talented Cost Center, um, this includes funding for one full-time GT <coughs> teacher and then all of the related expenses, um, an online assessment for uh, screening and identification, and then uh, books and supplies to continue to grow that program. We um, we serve 52 GT-identified students in grades 4 through 8, and that cost center, the proposal is that it will increase by $6,200, which just reflects um, a change in, um, in, a, in, a, in staffing. Um, and then finally, the Volunteer Services Cost Center, this provides funding for the, our Volunteer Extended Learning opportunities, coordinators, salary benefits, etc. And um, and that we're recommending, well that will go up, uh, it's, it's essentially flat, it will go up 2% just because of negotiated increases. So, <coughs> that's it. Thank you. Very good. Peter has to do that on nutrition services and Marcy can I'm going to give us some information. Yes, I thought I'd give a little orientation before Peter starts tonight. Um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background about the nutrition services. 
we keep nutrition services in a separate fund, Fund 30. The state requires us to separate the fund so that it's easily accounted to the federal government from their process. So we are required to keep nutrition services separate. Um, the funding sources come from several different areas. I just want to kind of review this. Forgive me, you probably already know this, but it's just a little pointy for everybody. The federal subsidy for Pond Cove and Middle School, Peter submits a claim every month for reimbursement, and this comes to about 66000 for the year for that reimbursement. The general fund from property tax revenue currently provides $74,000 to the operation. Scarborough, Town of Scarborough provides 63% of the director's benefits and salaries, the salary and benefits, sorry. And the remainder of the funding of the program, which runs a little over $800,000, we think right now, Peter and I, we watch it every month to see how it's going to come out for the end of the year. But the rest of the monies come from the school lunches paid for by students, faculty, administrators, people from the town, and that kind of thing. Um, this year, currently, the general fund has $74,000 that's used to go into Fund 30. There's a few portion, a few sub accounts that are in the general fund, travel, equipment, that kind of thing. And it's just a few. So I'm proposing that we just make the entire expense of a transfer into Fund 30 from the general fund. That's a slight difference from what you've seen in the past. That's why we included the detail so that you would kind of see what we're proposing. And um, I have approval from our auditor, and um, the state is, uh, I'm not worried about it. I have my email and to Tyler back to the state to make sure that that is okay. We are still getting our credit for the expense of the transfer for our subsidy portion of it and other reporting necessary. But it keeps it cleaner, and that way the full subsidy goes into Fund 30 without anything left getting left behind in the general fund. It's, it's just a clean way to do it. And when I get the final approval from Tyler back, as I know we're going you know, to have green light, but I just want to let you know that that's what we propose, and, and Peter and John and I have been talking about that. So to start out, the, I think the first seven years I was here, we were break even, um, break even where um, there was no money from, from uh, taxpayers that were part of our program. Um, we were able to do that because, um, for one, our, our salaries were lower um, and the revenue was, was higher at the time. Um, now we haven't had a price increase and we're only allowed to charge a certain amount of money for our school lunches, so our revenue can't increase anymore other than that. So one of the reasons for me taking on the job in Scarborough was to eliminate um, some of my salary in order to save some money. Um, at that time we had a manager that had gotten done, so we eliminated and we only have one, basically an assistant director that handles both schools with me overseeing that and, and being in the building. So basically I'm a third, like a third time employee, but I know I'm here for more. But um, one of the things that we did with our revenues um, that we had to do was we carried all the costs of our, um, our licensing for our POS systems, our POS systems, our repair costs, our equipment. We've had some help with Perry and Noel with some of that, but um, for the amount that we do every year, we have a menu software that we have to pay for. Um, so all that stuff was coming out of our, our revenue. So I think last year what the, what the transfer was, um, was 50, 58, 58 68. or something like that. So um, now our employees, I have, I would say 90% of all my employee, employees have been over here 10 plus years. So they're at the top of the scale. Um, so our salaries and benefits are a lot higher than they have been in the past. So anyways, we have uh, 12 employees. We have 12 employees excluding myself and my assistant director. Three of those are part-time and nine of those work seven hours or less a day. We had one retirement that we did not, we did not um, hire. Um, we just let that position go through attrition. Um, one of the things um, I just wanted to um, bring to the attention is we have one of the revenue streams that we do is our catering. We've done a, um, a lot of catering actually this year and 
which I'm grateful. That's a good revenue stream. We've done like 20 functions or so this year. But also what we're doing, one of the things is bringing in and doing special events. We did um, one last year. Um, we piloted with, uh, with Nate and, and Jeff and did a pasta dinner, which was really successful. We did a sushi dinner. And then um, coming up next week, we've got the police forces coming in to do it. So I've got flyers for everybody. Um, they're going to do a Mexican day. Um, the Cape Police Department comes in and eats lunch every day at the middle school. Um, and uh, Officer Galvin wanted to do something. So Robin's been working with them in their um, advisory class. And they've made cookies. and. Then they're doing this whole Mexican fiesta day, and it's on a Wednesday because most of the police force is going to be there. So the chief's going to be there. Everybody will be there. So you're all welcome to come and do that. I um, think it's a great opportunity to bring them into the buildings, and you know, it's it's good PR for them too. So. Um, just going over some of this, um, some of the lines, just so you're aware. Step development that I have down there, our, our employees all have to have um, training on a yearly basis. The directors have at least 12 hours, all other staff are six hours. Um, <coughs> we do an all staff training at the beginning of the year, which um, is a, at minimal cost, but we also have to pay travel and we pay those people their salary for that day. Um, so that's one of the things that we have, repair and maintenance. Um, we have $2,000 in there that didn't even cover one repair, so um, Perry's had to pick up some of that um, until and we had to buy a new piece of machinery that actually has made our deficit a little higher. We had to replace a, a failing piece of equipment that was a safety hazard. So we've got that all, all done, but then again, that was $22,000 that we weren't expecting to do. Um, and the fund transfer, that's what we were talking about. So Marcia said about transferring and having it basically preloaded and then having line by line. It's kind of how I do in Scarborough and, and it makes it cleaner, as she said, and also keeps the, um, um, the state are able to do their calculations and whatnot with the subsidy. So, um, and one thing that I find is a, as a challenge is with the new food shaming bill, if anybody has heard of that, um, historically in Cape, it's been, we've had a high negative account balances that we, we've uh, rolled over every year. Currently right now, we're owed about $22,000 that comes out of our, out of our department. So um, we, we send emails, letters, calls, um, so that's money that's still owed to us. I just wanted the, um, the board to be aware of that. That's going to be something that I may be addressing later on down the road with the finance committee. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, a key component and strength of the Cape Elizabeth Athletic Program has been the diversity of athletic offerings and the range of competitive levels for <coughs> students to explore and pursue their interests. Um, this doesn't happen without the hard work from our students, uh, families, and outstanding faculty and staff, and the support of this community. Um, so I sincerely thank you, or express my gratitude to all those involved. Um, a couple of increases to the athletic budget to note are um, in the officials fees for high school and middle school. That was a total of $3,600 uh, and that result was from a rate increase. Uh, also in the, at the high school level there was a $2,000 increase in the use of um, charters, uh, bus <coughs> companies that we do not have enough drivers for a particular day. Occasionally, we'll have to um, use charter companies. Um, also, an increase in the high school uh, coaches' salaries. Uh, that was a $1,500 increase, and um, that was to reflect the potential um, results of the collective bargaining agreement with um, Teachers Association. And a decrease to note because it's um, it's in the larger athletic equipment items that we use. Last year we purchased um, the gator that is used to um, transport water and ice and all over the fields. We use it for uh, 
setting up our postseason and preseason equipment needs. I mean, it's it's an invaluable piece of equipment, and um, the timing that was in the budget last year. The timing was perfect. Came in two days after, almost perfect. Two days after the previous skater had finally uh, transmission <coughs> was just completely gone. So called John Deere up and literally two days later it was already on track to be um, delivered. So timing worked out well there. But um, we do need to replace the uh, Hannaford Field storage shed. Um, right now that that shed was originally probably on the track at one point and prior to the track I think it was a from one of the local businesses from the 80s, maybe even, you know, 80s and 90s. I think it was Andy Strout's, one of his, uh, from his farm. Um, and also need to begin replacing our portable bleachers on Holman Field and Capano Field. Um, there were a couple of, or there, were, there was one um, staffing proposal that I think is, pretty self-explanatory, but just we'll quickly go into it. Um, it was for middle school indoor track and field coach. Currently we have two coaches. Um, this will provide necessary supervision and safety and instruction for practices and meets logistically with two people. Um, extremely challenging for two coaches managing 50 to 60 students um, on a daily basis in multiple locations. Um, and the next staffing proposal um, was for an, an athletic assistant slash groundskeeper. That was a .5, so it's a part-time position. Marcy, I don't, have, I, didn't, I don't have the figures on that, but I don't know if you have them yet as well, so we can... Yeah, in my notes, I don't want to say it off the top of my head, Jeff, because it was fully point five, but I want to say it was around twenty-four thousand. Okay. But I have that many notes too. Yeah. Um, this was designed uh, to assist the athletic department with maintaining the athletic fields, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more in depth, but I'll just kind of um, provide a an, an exp uh, description first here. Designed to assist the athletic department in maintaining the athletic fields, equipment repairs, maintenance, event management, whether it's pre-game setup, coverage, post-game, um, support with uniforms, equipment inventory, ordering, scheduling, uh, various responsibilities <coughs> in the athletic department. And to just add some perspective for the scope of the athletic program, at the high school we have 46 teams. 74 coaches, so that includes booster-funded and assistant coaches and volunteers. Um, 398 of the 530 stu students that are uh, currently enrolled, 75% play at least one sport. Um, so generally about 760 athletic contests plus total. At the middle school, we have 28 teams, 28, 26 coaches, um, a number of these coaches actually coach more than one sport. 80% uh, of our 7th and 8th graders involved in middle school athletics. Um, and there's probably about 350 plus athletic contests at, at that level. So um, that participation rate overall is about 78%. Um, about 1,100 athletic contests, 100 coaches, and 76 teams. So. To dive into this a little bit more, um, I think it's important, very important, to note that this proposal isn't a reflection of a department or any staff uh, for not doing their jobs. I think as the school and town and facility, recreational space and facilities, as, as those have um, grown, the staffing may not be growing at that same rate. Um, so that leaves a gap. And that gap often falls um, with athletics being in the middle. <clears throat> um, so we work 
very closely with our facilities and transportation director um, and, and his staff, um, Public Works, Bob Malley and his staff, and I'm extremely grateful for everything that they do. Um, countless situations where uh, I've called Perry for um, parking light, to turn parking lights on if they were off during a big game, and um, immediately that happens. Um, you know, Bob Malley, we, there were some nearby um, pigs from a farm that happened to escape and started rooting at Gull Crest prior to the start of a cross-country meet. And called Bob Malley. Two minutes, Jim Green and his crew were over there um, helping get that um, course set back up so that the kids could compete. So. Uh, it, it was, it was, well, somehow we were able to herd them away and it all worked. But, so just countless examples of where um, working with, with those two departments and, and how thankful I am for everything they do. But as I would mentioned, you know, there is a gap and I did make some copies. I thought for sure Noel was going to have a PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> <laughs> so as a backup, I have school board. I think I got six or something. So I had a, printed a few. So these are some of the things that end up um, on the athletic department. Often um, that, that would be myself. So everything from um, field maintenance uh, at Hannaford Field to patching seams on Hannaford Field, um, installing the sound system back on um, the bleachers, track, and, and this is just a few. I didn't want to use too much paper. Um, weed whacking and bush whacking the hill behind the Canterford Field um, in order to provide some access for kids to retrieve their balls when they go over the protective screening. Um, we have some erosion issues on Hannaford, so whenever we have a heavy rain, um, there is a lot of soot and sediment that will uh, go onto that field, so it's a matter of picking that up and um, disposing of that to fence repair uh, at postseason, putting goals away, making sure that they're level um, and secure. Um, during windstorms, uh, often heavy wind, we've uh, had to batten down the porta potties so that they don't tip over. So being caught, being you know, recognizing when there is going to be a storm, um, and a little more on the porta potties, just flattening them out so that they don't tip over if someone's using them. Uh, filling sandbags, uh, and then the last page is just some of this stuff has to be done. There's just not enough time to do it, so I'll bring it home into my garage and do it when I can. So, Jeff, tell us who did all this stuff. Yeah. Um, so, like I mentioned, that generally falls on the athletic department and <laughs> would be myself. So, this is, again, I just I want to do point out that it, it really is um, not anyone's fault. I think it's just there's just a lot of stuff and everyone has a lot of work to do. And um, sometimes some of these things, they just need to happen. And to do that, I think we have some, you know, the expectation is to make sure that you know, we have safe and um, you know, uh, appealing and um, good, good facilities. So that, that's something that I, I feel very strongly about and um, we try to, to try to make that work. So, it's, it has increased over the you know past few years, um, and I think it's important just to 
for people to just know that that's a um, there's a there's a pretty strong need there. Um, so that's that was my last piece there. Um, operational budget, pretty much status quo, but there are were several staffing needs that <coughs> were important to note. So that is it. Thank you. He does spend most of his weekends weed whacking. Pretty good weed whacker. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, department 9,000, the budget for the office of the superintendent is a cut off three cents. <laughs> um, and that's mostly due to salary and benefit increases. Um, there is also uh, included in this some funding for course reimbursement. We have Marcy is going to start a master's program this year and then um, is continuing um, to work on her bachelor's degree. So we um, for the really increases there at department. 9001 is the school board line, and this budget has gone up 5% uh, mostly due to an increase in insurance liability and uh, for membership uh, membership dues to MSMA. And that did increase $838 this year. Um, they haven't had an increase in many years, so this is um, an increase that they feel that they need to make. We were, we were one of the smaller, our district was one of the smaller increases, so that was good. but. Um, they're working to continue to provide the quality and breadth of services that they continue to uh, currently have in place. So that is the reason for the increase. So, <laughs> Everybody looks a little confused. <laughs> um, I do Kathy's have, trying to catch your attention. Oh, is a new position? Oh, uh, new position, sorry. You're not done. Thanks, Kathy, because I'm sorry. I forgot. I forget about this one. This one was in, two, in the budget two years ago. It's the um, support for the nurses. And it was put in um, two years ago as a uh, part-time nursing support and part-time uh, special ed support. We've moved the, or are in the process of moving the specialized files to um, our offices, and last year we cut that whole position. Um, talking to the nurses, they really wanted someone who had an LPN, had a nursing background. So when they were entering the data, um, what they found was um, that if a person didn't have the LPN background, the, the data that they were entering didn't really mean anything and it got put in the wrong places and it was kind of a mess. So they really wanted to kind of start from the beginning and um, and have an, add a 0.5 LPN position um, and that this person could also do some intaking of students and have a better understanding of um, um, the medical field and, um, and the, for the inputting of data and for talking to the students. So, I promised them last year when we took it out that we would rework it and put it back in next year. So um, it, is, it is here. And this does represent um, an LPN. Now I'm done. <laughs> now we are done. So this budget, um, this budget is our um, original request budget. And if you remember from last year, um, we did come in, I think last year it was around 7.5% and we worked it and worked it, worked on it. Um, and we did get it down to a 5.9% and that was, um, that was our final budget, 5.9 inches over uh, the year before. This budget represents about an 8% increase, so we're not really that far off of what, where we were when we started. I um, want everybody at home to know that we are continuing we, and will continue to work on this. Um, this, is, um, this is what we all believe that it would take to run our 
school district optimally, but we also know that we have to be fiscally responsible mm -hmm. as a citizen of the, world, the um, community. So we will just started really working on it. Um, this is what we're putting out there. Or we'll go back continually and look at it. So, and I'm sure that the board will have some questions that um, we'll need to answer. Maybe that will, that will help us with our work. So. Well, I appreciate everybody and um, the time that you put into these presentations. I appreciate Donna reminding us too that this is the original request budget, that this is really, this is not the end of the story, this is the beginning of the story. And so, you know, we will have some work to do together. But again, thank you to each and every administrator and department director. We appreciate the time and the effort that goes into everything behind these presentations and the conversations that you have and the teamwork that is behind all of this. Um, at this time, I would like to ask the audience if there are any comments that they would like to make. I could speak on a couple of issues just to, just to get them out there. So, um, the, the, not many. Um, I know that uh, Jason spoke about uh, the Pond Cove principal. Jason Win, spoke I'm about. I'm sorry to be rude, but do you mind just for? Oh, my topic? name is Wynn Phillips, <laughs> and I am a te English teacher at the high school, and also the president of the Cape Elizabeth Thank Education you. Association. That's what you're what. <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so anyway, um, yes, Jason spoke about uh, four lunch aids, uh, two of which he was able to fill this year, and the idea of one permanent sub. Um, I think that uh, we all know that planning time is, is, uh, an issue, has been an issue at, at Pond Cove, and those lunch aids were uh, meant to alleviate that. So anything uh, that we can do to, to try to attract four aids um, to free up time for, for teachers, uh, that would be wonderful. And that sub position, I think, is uh, a, really, a really good idea. Um, as we all know, it's very difficult to find subs now with a tight job market and uh, taking teachers out of their classroom or out of um, a situation where they may be um, engaged in planning to fill in for someone else just doesn't, uh, doesn't, it's not using them optimally. So it would be good if we could, uh, if, those, if those things could be funded. Um, Jeff also talked about um, an ed tech for the librarian. Um, I can speak, I think, on behalf of the entire staff that uh, we have without a doubt, one of uh, the best librarians you would ever see. She's incredible. She will, she, um, you know, you ask, she's there to help you. But you should watch the poor woman running around. Um, she is constantly on the go and overwhelmed with things. And I think that one of the, the school board's policy is to try to do everything to, uh, to attract and retain people. And if, if, if we were to lose her because she felt like, you know, I just can't do this anymore, that would be a, that would be a, a, a terrible loss for the district um, because she is one of the best. And uh, I think earlier this year, um, I had spoken about uh, some of the large class sizes, um, particularly in math, and I was glad that Jeff brought that up um, because I think that that's, uh, that's certainly an issue and um, kids not getting that instruction, we know how important that is. So those were the things that I... That's it. So, thank you. Thank you, Wayne. <clears throat> Is there anybody else that would like to speak tonight? Okay. So, I would like to remind the board to please submit your comments and questions via email to me, not out to all the various people, but to me because um, there are. There, I'm, every time there's a lot of overlap and so what we love to do is to um, consolidate and just ask the question once instead of several different lists of questions Jason gets one list and the questions are consolidated and having sat next to Heather and watched us watching us take notes I can already see the consolidation gonna be able to happen so please submit your questions to me and then um, I can consolidate and send those lists out to the administrators it would be wonderful if you could do that at least three days prior to the next workshop, which isn't until February 25th, so you have plenty of time. But I like to be respectful of the administrators to give them those lists. 
with enough time if there's any research needed to be done so that they can be prepared, <coughs> bring those questions back to us at the subsequent meeting. So thank you for that. Board members, Dave, that you want those two, the meetings on the... It's on the 25th, so at least three days prior. So the 22nd would be wonderful. But before the 22nd is also okay. Um, so in conclusion, I'd like to thank everyone for committing to this long but important evening to start the 2020-2021 school budget review. We appreciate you being here and appreciate the people who were here for a long time and then had to leave. Um, and wish you a good night. Thank you.